Welcome to The Baton, a John Williams musical journey. Join host Jeff Cummings as he takes you through the career of the illustrious film composer John Williams, starting with his debut in 1959 through more than 100 films in 60 years. Today we hear the music from Penelope, made in 1966. Now here's your host, Jeff Cummings. Welcome back, everyone. We're almost into spring. I hope that you're all thawing out wherever you are. Unless you're in the southern hemisphere, I guess you're getting ready for winter. So get those sweaters out. And we now have two more films featuring John Williams scores from 1966 to dive into. And they're both comedies featuring well-known actors in not-so-good stories. This episode is going to focus on Penelope, which was MGM's answer to the more popular How to Steal a Million that came out from 20th Century Fox four months earlier. Natalie Wood was the star of Penelope, and just like Audrey Hepburn was during the release of How to Steal a Million, Wood's popularity was at its peak. She was five years removed from playing Maria in West Side Story in the film, and at the time of the release of Penelope, she had scored three Academy Award nominations, and she was not yet 30 years old. In August 1966, Wood got a lot of acclaim for her performance in the Sidney Pollack film This House is Condemned and would get a Golden Globe nomination for it. Her work in Penelope three months later, though, would not get the same kind of praise. In 1965, Wood was not in a good place mentally, still grieving her divorce to the actor Robert Wagner. Like most actors do, she decided to dive into her work to help ease the suffering she felt away from the studio. She was offered a hefty sum, nearly one million, to star in Penelope, which was being adapted from a novel with Wood in mind. If you look at Natalie Wood's filmography, you will see very few comedies in it, and Penelope proves why. She's not a comedian, and a review of the film in Variety tried hard to find something good to say, mentioning that Wood, quote, does a nimble job, end quote, whatever that means. Reports indicate that Natalie Wood was so anxious about her work on Penelope that she often broke out in hives, causing the production to be halted while she healed. Arthur Hiller, the director of Penelope, is credited as telling her, Natalie, I think you're resisting this film. If you watch the film, you could see why Wood felt like she wasn't doing well. There isn't much to it, and is essentially a vehicle for the lavish wardrobes by the costume designer Edith Head. Other than that, it's 90 minutes of nothing much. And with spoilers ahead, I'll tell you a bit about it. Wood plays Penelope Alcott, a woman who robs a bank in the opening scene. She's pretty, which is meant to throw us off of her criminal behavior. That's what was intended as well with Audrey Hepburn in How to Steal a Million, but she and director William Wyler pulled that off much better. We later find out that Penelope is stealing from her husband James's bank, and Penelope's analyst helps her to understand that she's a kleptomaniac who likes stealing because her life is boring and her husband ignores her. In the end, she manages to get away scot-free with the crime and all turns out well for the happy couple. I do want to mention that Peter Falk plays the detective looking for the bank thief, and this serves as an audition of sorts for his more famous work as Detective Columbo, who would make his debut in 1967. This was John Williams' first project with MGM, and he was smart to make movies with a variety of studios instead of sign a contract with one company. He's going to get much better work with MGM in the very near future, including Fiddler on the Roof. I do have issue with the way John Williams is credited in this film. Nowhere in the opening credits or in the end credits is he mentioned as the composer of the score. The only mention he gets is as the co-writer of the theme song, a light and frothy 60s era song that sounds like it was written for the Beach Boys, but ultimately performed by the Penny Pipers, whose sole performance credit seems to be this one song. I think the session singers who were brought in to sing the song got the name, which is blended with the nickname of the lead character, Penny, and a number, another name for a group of singers, Pipers. Sure, a girl who walks with 
the rhythm of a lady tiger. Picture a girl who talks with the sweetness of a honeybee. Picture a girl your mind could never dismiss. This is Penelope. Penelope. The day the angel made this plan. Williams composed the song with an Englishman named Leslie Brickus, whose star was rising fast in Hollywood. He's one year older than John Williams and got his start writing musicals for the stage in the early 1960s. Before 1966, Brickus was best known as one of the lyricists for the song Goldfinger, made popular by Shirley Bassey in the 1964 film of the same name. He also won the Grammy for Song of the Year in 1963, for what kind of fool am I? If you are a longtime fan of John Williams, you know that Williams and Brickus enjoyed many great collaborations writing songs over the years. After Steven Spielberg, I would count Leslie Brickus as Williams' best collaborator. And we've got many more Williams Brickus songs to discuss throughout this podcast series. So the majority of the underscore to Penelope is essentially an adaptation of the song's theme, not a surprise given its catchy melody. The composition of the main theme and its use throughout the film will become a hallmark for Williams, and he'll remain one of the few composers of the time to use these motifs prominently in his music to help us identify a character or their actions. The main theme has an addictive quality that is at times gorgeous and mysterious, very much like the character for which it is written. We first hear it as Penelope escapes the bank that she has just robbed in a taxi headed for the department store Bergdorf's. This piece of music relies heavily on the electric guitar backing up the performance of the main theme on clarinet, which would not have been my first choice for the first instance of underscore. 
It portrays Penelope as a bit funky with a 60s cool vibe instead of movie star gorgeous that she really is. We're going to hear more lush orchestrations of the main theme later, and those are the versions I like the most. Penelope visits her analyst, Gregory, who is shocked that Penelope has a history of kleptomania. In an attempt to discover the motives, Penelope talks about the first time she stole something. It happened during a visit to her anthropology professor at college. The professor, played by Jonathan Winters, tries to take advantage of Penelope during the last week of the semester. In the ensuing chaos around the classroom, Penelope's dress rips and falls off of her, leaving her only in her bra and panties. John Williams takes a primal approach to the music in this scene, going heavy on the percussion and brass with a slightly comical theme. We get Penelope's theme as she runs out of the building in only her underwear, and she notices that she took the professor's pocket watch. In the next flashback scene, Penelope and James have just gotten married, and in attendance at the reception is Mildred, who has always been in love with James. William scores the entrance of the happy couple with what we are supposed to believe is source music playing at the reception. It's another instrumental version of the theme song. When Penelope realizes that her husband has disappeared from the party, Williams puts in a brief stinger to accompany James being cut out of the picture before returning to the instrumental. Music playing when Penelope discovers James and Mildred kissing in the bedroom is a slinky number led by the flute, highlighting the sexual tension in the room.
Penelope gets her revenge on Mildred by stealing her diamond earrings and her necklace. So far, we've heard a romanticized version of Penelope's theme and a comical version of it. I will always be amazed at how Williams can write notes that can be used in many different forms to convey an emotion he wants. I bet if there was a comical scene in the Star Wars films featuring Darth Vader, I'm sure Williams could have composed a comical version of the Imperial March and it would sound right in place. In addition to Penelope's theme, Williams composed another motif for the film. It's for the main villains, a couple named Sabata and Ducky. We meet them in a thrift store where Penelope is looking to unload the dress she wore when escaping the bank heist. Sabata and Ducky see the ex expensive Givenchy dress and con the store owner into giving it to them for just $7 when it's worth more than $1,000. We get more of that funky Penelope theme music as Penelope changes wigs in the taxi to the thrift store. Then William sets up the Sabata and Ducky theme, played on an electronic organ, as well as a flute. This is such a fun criminal theme, and it's going to inspire Williams, I think, when it's time for him to write theme for the criminals in Superman and Home Alone. Writing a menacing theme for a villain is pretty easy. Writing something comical with a bit of evilness underneath, I think, is much more difficult. But it seems like Williams has a good knack for it. So Penelope and her analysts are getting closer to the cause of her recent thefts, and they take a trip further back through memory lane to the time Penelope and James met. Penelope was a singer at a bohemian club in Greenwich Village, and James was a loan officer sent to collect on a past due payment from Penelope. 
The two have a cute moment backstage when Penelope drops her contact lens on the floor and they both dig through the carpet looking for it. The main theme gets even more romantic this time and slows down as the flute allows us to fall for this couple in this overly sweet scene. Back to the present, and Penelope has run into Peter Falk's character, a lieutenant leading the bank heist case, at the thrift store where Penelope dropped off her dress. The two eventually go to the dress store where Sabata and Ducky try to sell the dress for $600 before the detective flashes his badge. Our villain's theme returns on the organ as we see Sabata and Ducky pretty much getting orgasmic over pastrami. One more quick flashback scene before we get into the third act of the film. Penelope talks about her life after James becomes the bank manager. He begins to take less of an interest in her and she's getting frustrated by it. At a party thrown by a rich bank client, we get some dance music that sounds familiar. You will find out that yes, it is the instrumental version of the theme song. The music changes to an ethnic dance that requires all the dancers to fall into a pile when the music stops. Everyone obliges, and Penelope comes up with two handfuls of jewelry from the bottom of the heap, with a flute run at the end celebrating her loot.
It's tricky to compose source music that flows immediately into the underscore that the characters don't hear. There is a lot of it in this film, and I think that is the highlight of the score. Let's get into the third act when the heat is getting hotter for Penelope. Gregory meets up with Penelope at an art museum, trying to convince her not to steal a precious work of art. In order to not arouse suspicion with the police, Gregory tiptoes around the museum. We start the scene with some of the sneaking around instrumentation you would expect, plucked strings and piano tinkling. Penelope shows Gregory the money from the bank, which he takes, and decides to return through the bank's night deposit box. This is more sneaking around music, played this time on flute and bassoon, with some percussion thrown in to make it interesting. Penelope is ready to confess her crimes to everyone, and she decides to return all the stolen jewels at a lavish party. But no one takes ownership of the jewels because they reported them stolen and took the insurance money. But Penelope doesn't know that, and she runs out of the party in confusion. Frantic strings follow Penelope with her theme underneath. The next day, Penelope robs James's bank again, but when he finds Penelope at Gregory's office, all seems to be forgiven and the couple make up, with Williams giving us one final run-through of the main theme before closing it out with a bang. The box office performance of Penelope was so bad that it compelled Wood to go into semi-retirement from acting. She didn't do another movie for three years. The album release of the score probably performed just as poorly. Under his new role as music producer, 
John Williams was keen on getting his music into record stores no matter what type of movie it was. Similar to what he did for How to Steal a Million, John Williams put out an album of his score choosing to re-record the music using different instrumentation and presenting the music in a different fashion than just putting the score in chronological order. Most of that album consisted of the source music played where the theme was arranged to play for a party or a dance hall, or what might be considered concert versions of such cues as the theme for the villains played on clarinet instead of the organ. It's strange that Williams elected to release an album of his score using re-recorded music that sounded slightly different. Certainly, this would have cost the studios more money to get an orchestra to play the music again. It had to be cheaper to just take the original tapes and edit it into a cohesive album, but Williams wouldn't realize this for a few more years. So this was the fourth film with John Williams' music released in 1966, and while he was working on these films, he was still immersed in creating music for television. One of his jobs in 1966 was to create a theme for a new program called The Tammy Grimes Show, starring the popular Broadway actors of the same name. In a way, this was a precursor to the Mary Tyler Moore Show, all the way down to the title character throwing her hat in the opening credits. But The Tammy Grimes Show only lasted for five episodes, citing Grimes' lack of charisma for television. Back in the 1960s, the networks tended to let their shows run the course of a season, even if the reviews were bad. But this show was the exception, meaning John Williams' composition of the main theme was not heard very much. And here's a listen to that main title theme. In a way, it has some similarities to the theme for Penelope, which I suppose can't be helped. Not only were both shows about feisty women, but Williams was so deep in writing his music that some of it was bound to have a familiar sound, especially as he continued to find his composing voice. You can certainly hear his voice coming through in Penelope, even if it was a bit shaky and unsure at times. John Williams closed out 1966 with one more comedy, this one starring future Oscar winner George C. Scott. Join me next time for a listen to the music from Not With My Wife You Don't. As always, I look forward to your comments about this episode or any episode in this podcast. Send me an email to jeffswim at aol.com or post a comment on the Podbean app. I look forward to the next episode, and until then... The baton is down. Picture a girl whose life is as crazy as a mad magician.